Hello everyone. This is going to be me just freestyling. So um, I'm looking at SurrealDB docs. So if you don't know, SurrealDB is a modern kind of multi-purpose Swiss Army knife of a database, which, uh, yeah, I can't even begin to do it justice. But um, if you look at documentation, there's some documentation for embedding SurrealDB in Rust. And you might have seen my previous videos where I've attempted to do that. And that's something I will come back to in due course. So, just to give some backstory to this video, this video, if you imagine it's a live stream, but it's not a live stream because I'd probably only have two viewers, uh, two or three. Anyway, so um, yeah, this is just going to be me kind of freestyling with no kind of uh, PowerPoint presentation or any pre prepared stuff. So, you can see what I've got on the screen. I've got in the background, I've got Neo Vim running with Rust Analyzer, like I always do with uh, a Capuchin theme. Um, so I'm looking at lifetimes and probably one of the, I don't know, one of the biggest scariest things possibly when you start learning Rust is the lifetimes because it's not something that you've had to have dealt with with other languages. Um, and I'm still, I still try to avoid ever having to use lifetimes. Uh, and there's odd words such as uh, elision, which elision just means leave out, I think. It's not a IT word as such or programming word. It just it's a, it's, it existed in language long before that. So um, we're looking at SurrealDB. So let me just uh, make this full screen. And I'm going to zoom in on it also. There we go. Right. So the bit. I am interested in is this bit. So a or single apostrophe, the apostrophe rather than the uh, the quote, should we call it? So we've got the um, apostrophe a, which is the lifetime. Now I learned this when I started learning Rust, but I kind of uh, I learned so much other stuff I half forgot this, but Everything in Rust actually has a, a lifetime behind the scenes. It's just implicit, so it's not shown. With this, this is a struct for a database. It's a real DB, it's a database. And with this, I wanted to um, know why. So quite often I'll learn things, but I'll, I'll also want to learn why. Why is it necessary? Why do I have to do it this way? Um, <laughs> it's a bit like uh, you know learning to do your shoelaces up when you're a kid. Fine, well, I've learned to do them, but why? And arguably, that's a, that's a good question because why not just have slip-on shoes? Right. So apostrophe a that's the lifetime. Now this is like you will see when you use generics. So obviously you see a capital T there when you're using a generic type T and because this first and last are text you have several choices in Rust and what I have done everywhere up until now and I've just been doing structs for my own learning and experimentation I would always just put this in as a string so Everywhere where I've used text in a struct, I've always used string just because um, it just seemed easier. So, uh, yeah, string there, and then I would just do um, city uh, Cardiff. Um, oh yeah, then you need to, then you can do two. You could do two owns. But I think uh, two string is more recognizable, should we say. Um, so that compiles. Fine. And that's what I've pretty much always done up until now, because I'm... I think it's human nature to avoid things which are difficult. So I think kind of a good rule of thumb is to try and actually force yourself to do things which are difficult. And... Um, so we want 
I've almost forgotten what I what I needed to type here. So ampersand apostrophe a uh, static comma. And then we want to get rid of that. Okay, and that's wrong already because why is that wrong? Should be ampersand uh, ampersand apostrophe stuff. Sorry, I'm mixing these up here, aren't I? It should be. Let's go back to the. So we the example. Post, ampersand apostrophe a, and then stir. So static is okay, but but it's not the best way. And I'm just going to check in my book. Why is it not? Yeah. So if we use static, it must be able to live for the whole of the program. Whereas with stir, it's only got to live long enough for the duration of the life of the struct. That's right. So um this I feel a bit um naked here really because I'm kind of exposing my lack of knowledge or my <laughs> exposing my ignorance here because um yeah I am learning Rust and lifetimes are probably one of the things which you might brush under the carpet to be. I certainly do. Uh, so here, this name is. Um, so yeah, you can either do static where it's got to live for the length of the program or stir where the variable's got to live for the length of the life of the struct. Right. So. Um, Let's go back to Surreal DB rather than my code. I think that would be wise. For those of you who don't know, um, I think the, the programmer or one of the directors, Toby, I think he's got a master's or a PhD in computer science. So, yeah, amazing that he, he's obviously uh, oh, he's quite young, so I think he kind of grew up on Rust, which is amazing. Um, yeah, so Surreal, if you're using the database, you said a serialized, deserialized features derive. I always forget derive. I'll add Surreal and then I'll, for, then I'll get compile error and I remember I need to add features to Tokyo macros RT multi-thread. So the database that I used in my recent video was this one, BoxDB. Anyway, progress. So we've got the lifetimes and why are the lifetimes? Yeah, let me go back to why. So I'm jumping around a bit here, so I hope it's not annoying. <laughs> I think it, when you're learning, particularly when you're learning Rust, you probably I don't know about you, but I do find myself jumping around just because I end up with so many questions and it's the kind of a real curiosity to chat GPT. I know it technically it's not the best, but um, I, I think if, I, if I'm an idiot, then chat GPT is slightly above an idiot. <laughs> I'm an idiot and chat GPT is just quite stupid. Trouble is, I'm an idiot and chat GPT is, more, is better, but it tells more lies. So do you want an honest idiot or do you want, um, <laughs> I don't know, lying, lying artificial intelligence it, it uh, hallucinates. Right, let's read this. So using string slices, I'm Sandstruer, instead of owned strings, string, so that's owned, you know, that's why where you do the two owned or two string can be advantageous. So let's zoom in on this. this bit. 
gonna go. Uh, it's kind of jumped up the screen a bit now. Sorry about that. Uh, where, 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 where? So basically, I asked ChatGPT why they use the string slices. Can be advantageous in certain scenarios, particularly when dealing with data that you don't need to own or modify within the struct. So, with a database, that's quite common. Database obviously is, is different to a, um, a typical REST program because with REST program, you want to be modifying much of the code you're working much of the much of the data many of the data structures you're working with but with a database quite often you'll more often than not you'll probably just want to be wanting to read so that's the data that you don't need to own or modify ownership and lifetimes by using string slices i.e first and last name is string slices. The struct can reference data owned elsewhere. So it's owned. Um, don't quite know what that means, but um, it, it can reference the data owned elsewhere. So ownership just means, I learned this the other day as well. So ownership means it's, it's if you own the data then you're responsible or that that's the bit that's responsible for um freeing it or dropping it at the end scope where it's been used this can be useful if the data is owned by another struct or is managed externally the apostrophe a lifetime parameter indicates that the struct contains references with lifetime tied to some external scope so it's all about ownership scope um, so memory efficiency string slices are lightweight and don't own the underlying data so they're not responsible for uh, freeing the memory at the end of the current scope they're just references to data stored elsewhere. So yeah, <laughs> I think I'm probably laboring the point here, but uh, it's probably important just to kind of uh, help uh, help uh, really get to the, the crux of it. This can save memory compared to using own strings. If you have a large number of instances, these structs, these structs and the strings are relatively large or numerous. So yeah, this is particularly relevant with a database because you have a large number of instances of these structs. So immutability and safety string slices are immutable references. If the data is not intended to be modified within the struct using string slices, forces immutability at compile time, which can help prevent accidental modifications and ensure thread safety. Uh, avoiding unnecessary allocation. You don't need to modify the strings or take ownership of them within the struct. Using string slices avoids unnecessary heap allocation. So obviously the heap allocation is slower than the stack. And the allocations that would occur with owned strings. This can lead to better performance, especially in performance critical code paths. So yeah, database, many records, performance is critical, and there's just no need to take ownership of the data. So um, let, let, let's just, just uh, check with ChatGPT. Uh, remind me what is the definition of ownership rust. Answer 30 words max.
So yeah, every value of a single owner, which is responsible for managing its memory deallocation. So yeah, ownership basically just means you're responsible for throwing it in the bin afterwards. Right, okay. So I think um I think I'm getting to kind of uh get a good idea of why the surreal DB example uses ampersand apostrophe A space stir. It's really it's not the user friendly, it's it's not the most user friendly. I guess it's gradually built up because obviously they, it all means something. So ampersand means reference, apostrophe means lifetime, A is just the letter that we assign to it, and stir is a primitive type in Rust. So, um, And obviously it's just like uh, T and U and everything. We, we don't have to use A, we could use, um, use B. As long as they match, and we could, it doesn't even have to be one letter, so boo. There we go, that still compiles. So. All good. Um, this, As I say, this is a kind of an unscripted video, but I just wanted to share, share the SurrealDB documentation and just um, confirm my crude understanding of using string slices and beginning to look at lifetimes. I think lifetimes is just something which you kind of grasp the concept of when you start learning Rust, but the actual putting into practice is a, a totally different thing. So yeah, we use, so this example uses Tokyo because it's asynchronous because it's going off and doing stuff. Um, so it's returning a future, I think is right. And then, yeah, you're getting back the create a new person with a. Oh, yeah, so you connect to the database. That's in, in memory. Select specific namespace. I still haven't, uh, I can't remember what a namespace is. It, in, I think you can have multiple databases in one namespace. I think that's right. Create a new person with a random ID. Uh, with Surreal, you can have, you can actually specify the ID and you can either specify that as a sequential incremental numeric ID or you could actually use part of the, um, part of the records uh, information. So you could actually, if you had, 10 people you could actually use each person's name but obviously then you get run into things like uh, having a duplicate if you know you'll never have a duplicate in every name or grid reference or country is different if you only use it once then see that is the id uh so yeah the record that's a surreal db type um most of this is pretty understandable even to someone like me um debug debug i that's a good thing that i was learning about <coughs> earlier so if we do uh debug my city this will run if we you see what's happened? It won't run. It, it won't compile. And that's because debug actually takes ownership of that my city. Um, so we could do this. That should that will compile because here on this line um, we're taking a reference. So we're not uh, deallocating it afterwards um, and we're not consuming it with this line we are so I could actually we could actually um, you can have many references 
but you can only have one without a reference. Uh, let's go back to the Cyril DB code. Um, so yeah, just uh, just to carry on, we've got down to looking at debug. Let's look at um, query bind. If you've used um, Axum, you'll be familiar with bind. So it's a way of passing in um, strings, I think, into um, so what bind always comes kind of this sort of functional. So it always um, it, it comes after something else, and then it's kind of doing a substitution. So table goes into table, pers and uh, person. Um, oh yes, yeah, so person goes into table, and then table goes into there so that's actually person so that is person so the table is called person and that that's correct because we've actually selected the person table up here so yeah that goes person goes into table and then table goes into there and then that gets converted back to person again um let's just have another look down here uh you Next to local remote database endpoint. Surreal DB, just in, if you don't know or you've not really looked at it in detail, Surreal DB handles a lot of the um, authentication. Well, it, if you wanted to create something with good security and uh, secure login and authentication, rather than having to do all that in Rust, code it yourself, you can. Uh, use the Surreal DB API to do that for you. Uh, using tuple there. Great, so record in the database. There's with a lot of the Surreal DB stuff. There's more than one way to do something, which is kind of good. But when you're learning, it's confusing because you don't. It, there's not a single right or wrong answer, and that's sometimes that's a bit uh, frustrating when you're starting off. Uh, let's have a look at that. So the WSS, that's WebSocket. So it, rather than um, HTTP or gRPC, it's, so, so that's collect, connecting to a SurrealDB cloud database, as it says there. Um, So that's returning a result. It's a surreal DB result. Act. Yeah, there you go. This. Oh, we've got WS and we've got WSS. I'm guessing extra S is secure. Right, so if it's local, 1S. Remote two S's, I'm guessing. Um, yeah. So if if you if you're interested in Surreal DB, have a look at my earlier videos. Um, I've done about two or three. Um, I did one where I just introduced actually Surreal DB syntax and just used um, Thunder client in VS Code, a bit like Postman. Um, I don't know if I imagined it, but I thought that SurrealDB were creating their own key value database. I must admit, I've not um, watched the recent videos. There's quite a few that they've put out on YouTube, which um, that's really cool. So, yeah, that's SurrealDB. Um, and, yeah, back to, back to this code. Uh, Let's just get rid of these four lines. And let's just do something with that. So um, if we want to, let's say we want to print the name and the date founded. So
and let's pass in my city dot name dot date found it and hopefully we will find it. There we go. So um let's just change that back to AA. I think once you've learned a bit more about, or per, I'm speaking personally here, but once I kind of learned a bit more about generics and got used to using the um, angled brackets of generics, coming back to lifetimes isn't quite so scary or, or um, non, I would say nonsensical. Oh, let's just for lols, let's put in a result here as well. So let's just say we'll handle the result. And it's either a result or it's a standard error. Go. Okay. And then let's put a OK. And I must admit, the error handling in Rust is something I really need to, um, yeah, brush up on. Uh, I think it. Um, tests i think because the compiler is so good in rust i think the tests for me personally i'm just just my opinion by the way i think tests are, don't seem quite as important as they would do in other languages i don't know if you agree but um let's just uh, i'll just do cargo mt and uh, let's do cargo clippy Wow, didn't complain. Um, oh, just something else I was learning recently was you stood time. Again, I'm just freestyling here, so um, feel free to disappear, um, fast forward, whatever. Um, this gives you elapsed. So what I'm going to do is just say let's um, start equal system now. And then before we do the OK, we can just do uh, I'm just going to do print statement and then just say um, just print uh, start. So you say start there and then you do elapsed. All good. This will be microseconds. This will be like three microseconds or something. Let's go. 14 microseconds. Okay, let's run it again. Wow. You can see my. Oh, that was 21, 21, 162, 16. Okay. But there you go. There's uh, how to how to measure the, kind of how to benchmark your code. I don't know why that's taking so long. That's taking, right, let's, um, so I'm going to run it from here. I don't think I should make it at all. 83, 55, 12, 20. Oh, it's because I'm using OBS, I think. I think it's because I'm using OBS. There we go, anyway. So, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. It's just kind of a bit of a random, just a bit of a random freestyle and a look at lifetimes and look at using. Uh, um, time instant to benchmark your code and just trying to understand some surreal db code and understand why they used a uh, string slice and it used lifetimes where many of the structs that you'll see in kind of beginner tutorial books will always show here they would always show just a string 
And as we've seen, a string actually um, could be very costly if you've got millions of structs or you know, millions of records. And each record contains structs. So, yeah, thanks for watching. And, uh, yeah, give me a thumbs up, subscribe, all that usual nonsense everyone on YouTube says. It's boring, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Cheers. Catch you soon.